learning outcome two is all about clients and audiences so the basic part of the exam is to read through the client brief be able to pick out the important details and think about who your target audience is going to be and what kind of steps you would take to make sure that the product is suitable for them first of all you need to know the different types of client brief so we have contractual, negotiated, informal, formal and tender. One type of client brief that you can get is a formal client brief. Now this is where everything is very formal. It involves scheduled meetings between yourself and the client. And basically you get an outline of all of the requirements, what is expected. This one has proper written documentation with all the rules and regulations details is exactly what you need to produce. It often involves having regular meetings with the client to show them where you're up to, what you've done so far, and to go over any possible improvements that you might do. Examples of where you might use a formal client brief is for things like a website or an app that you might make for somebody. The formal client brief is quite often what you will see in the exam. Another type of client brief that you will uh, need to be aware of is informal. So an informal client brief is where there's no written paperwork, there's no actual documentation. It's usually like a verbal agreement on what they actually expect from you. So often this is agreed like during a phone call or through a Skype conversa uh, conversation. An example of this is maybe within a business, like within your school, uh, one person might ask somebody else to do something for them or between two friends where you might know somebody that makes websites for you and you can just ask them what you want. A negotiated client brief is when you would work as the producer, you would work with the client to develop the brief. So you would talk about things, you'd have discussions, you'd make a lot of um, kind of conversation and make some decisions and agree on them before you would actually write up the client brief. Sometimes this might take the form of a client brief given to you and you could annotate it and um, challenge certain things, make some changes and eventually you will come up with a negotiated client brief which you've both agreed on. Um, an example of this is a manager giving a team member a task to do. You might turn around and say well actually I can't do this, this and this or it would be better if we did this instead. You both agree on it and the final client brief is what you would work from. A contractual client brief is when the brief is outlined within a contract of employment. So an example could be a company hiring um, an artist to complete a series of artwork for them, uh, adhering to set rules and regulations. So you would give them a contract and everything, every single detail would be included in the contract of exactly what you want and they will all have agreed to it and if you don't get what you've agreed to in the contract then they won't receive any payment for it. A tender type of client brief is quite an interesting one because the client actually publishes an advert for the product that they want. So as an example, um, you might have completed a new product that you want advertising and you're not exactly sure what to do. So you could publish an advert to say, we want um, an advert creating for our product. Someone needs to bid. If you, get the, if you successfully win the bid, then you will get the money for this advert. And then what happens is a load of advertising companies can bid for their right to complete that project. So you might get four or five advertising firms. They will all say, this is what advert we want to create. This is our idea. And the clients will decide which one to go with. When they do that, obviously they will then be employed by that company to produce the advert and obviously come up with some sort of brief of what they want. A commissioned client brief is when the client will actually hire a separate independent company to create the full product. So they don't actually say this is what we want, this is what we need. They will leave it down to somebody else to decide. So you might know that you need an advert for your school, for example, 
but you're not really sure what you want. You haven't got any sort of ideas of what you want. So you would leave it down to them. You would give them the obvious basic information. What's the name of the school? Maybe a color scheme and things like that. But everything else would be completely down to them to do. So you're commissioning a different company to take full control. So you may be asked what the different types of contract are, but the main thing that you need to do is every single exam, you will have to interpret the client brief. So you will be given a client brief and you need to read through carefully and analyze what you need to do. So every single brief is going to have some sort of requirements. Some of them, you have to meet them. So there will be some requirements that you have to meet. So you're looking for words like must, uh, the the product must do this the product must do that the product will be aimed at a particular audience you can't change those things then you might get some um requirements that are open for interpretation so they're looking for suggestions they're looking for ideas that you might want to give the most important part about interpreting a brief is that if you don't get it right then you're not going to get paid so you need to make sure that you do exactly what the client is asking for So the different types of requirements in a client brief can be categorized into different sections. So if we use the acronym RICE to try and remember them, we have where the requirements are open. So this is where you've got some freedom to make your own decisions about how to create the product. Sometimes it might be a little bit of kind of flexibility on what you want to do design wise. You can have implicit requirements. So it's where it's inferred from the brief. So you've got to kind of interpret what it's saying. So it might be kind of general guidelines for you. Then you've got constraints. So these are where you might have some boundaries that are going to have a big impact on the product itself. So these could be like the legal things, uh, ethical constraints. It could be time that you might not have long enough to complete it to what you want to do. And it could be cost. You might not have enough budget to do what you want to do. Then finally, you've got explicit requirements. So this is the most important one, because if you don't meet these requirements, the client is not going to be happy with what you've done. So these are where they're really clearly stated and usually uses words like must, this must do this, this must do that. So once the brief has been analyzed, you've kind of gone through, you know what all the different types of requirements are. You know what type of brief it is. You've got a really good, clear idea of what the product needs to be. However, there's obviously some things that we need to know. So in the brief, it will usually tell you what the audience is. So for example, it could be um, age 16 to 24 year olds. It could be university students. It could be children under 12. These kind of categories for your audience will make a big difference to what the product's gonna look like. So the different categories that we need to look at for audience considerations, are socioeconomic, age, gender, ethnic group, psychographics, geodemographics, sexual orientation, and mainstream versus niche. So as you've studied in unit one, Basically, uh, one of the factors that you can look at for your audience is your socioeconomic status. So the ABC1 percentage is going to look at what percentage of the audience are going to fall into the categories of either A, B or C1. So this usually means like the kind of upper class citizens who are kind of doctors and lawyers and teachers and people like that. Now, the higher the percentage of ABC1 means the more likely they are to be in one of those positions, more wealthy, more educated and that kind of thing. That makes a big, big difference to the media product itself because certain people are not going to be interested in particular type of media product. For example, with films, a movie for ABC1 percentage, a high percentage of ABC1 would be 12 years a slave. Um, for magazines, the high ABC1 percentage would be something like Vogue. Now, if you put this in contrast to the C2DE section, people who are more likely to form into these bottom categories are people who are unemployed, uh, factory workers and people like that. They have less money and maybe 
not as much education so the audience for things like that are obviously going to be completely different so for magazine uh, comparison if you look at vogue for abc one percentage uh, being quite high whereas abc one percentage being quite low means that the audience are kind of less wealthy less educated so the magazines for those kind of things are things like in touch and gossip where it tends to be just celebrity news if you think about it including adverts as well so if you produce a product like vogue magazine for example and you know what your audience is there's no point in advertising products like a tag watch in a vogue in uh, an in touch or a gossip magazine because the people reading it can't afford it whereas if you put it into vogue some of the readers will have the money to do that So the age of a target audience is going to massively influence the product. It could affect how complex to make a game or an app. It could be how difficult to make the language used in a comic book or in a story. Uh, the age can often um, kind of control how much violence, how much uh, sex, how much blood, how much uh, adult themes like sex and nudity and things like that are all included in a film or a TV show. Age groups are usually defined in ranges, so things like 12 to 16, 17 to 25, 30 plus, maybe under fives, things like that. Obviously, this is going to be a big, big difference. If you look at two examples here, you've got Hannah Montana, so that's going to be aimed at kind of 13 year olds, maybe 10 to 13, whereas something like Poirot is aimed at a lot older, so kind of over 30s, maybe even over 40s. If you think about it from an exam context, what they often seem to do is expect you to understand that if it is for children, for example, you're not going to want to show any sort of violent themes. Um, you want to think about the adverts that are on the app or on a website or whatever product you've made. Any sort of adverts, you need to think about what suitable things uh, you can include as adverts and what you might want to avoid as well. So for a long, long time, gender was kind of an assumption. And as society kind of keep, keeps changing and kind of developing and people start becoming a bit more offended by things, you've got to kind of get rid of that general assumption now is that males and females have different interests completely. So it's always been kind of assumed that men will watch football and women will be more interested in fashion and clothes and gossip and things like that. But as things are changing, we need to kind of move away from that a little bit. So it makes it very, very difficult to target gender. So one best piece of advice to focus on really is to focus on interests. Obviously, you know, there are still a lot of products out there that are clearly targeted towards one gender. But you will find that people of the other gender still watch it or kind of get, a, a, um, kind of get offended that suggested that it's aimed at a particular thing um, so as I say the best thing to do really is to target people's interests so you target people that like football rather than one particular gender now ethnicity can have a massive impact on the success of your product so if you think that the internet has made everything so much more accessible around the world means that you get people watching your TV shows from mad countries all over the place. So you might have an American TV show, but it gets watched in Egypt, it might get watched in Japan. You've got to think about ethnicity and how you can make your product suitable for people of different eth ethnic groups. So if you think about some really popular examples, um, you've got things like Orange is the New Black. Now they have got inmates of all different shapes and sizes really they've got people from different ethnicities um black mexican kind of south american you've got white you've got kind of italian american irish american all sorts of different stereotypes all in that one particular tv show now that means that two things really one is you're not going to offend people from a particular race or ethnicity to say you know we, we don't want you in our show and two you're kind of attracting people from the different ethnic groups because they will see things that they 
feel about themselves in that particular character. Sexuality is another major impact on a product because you need to think about offense. So it's not going to necessarily completely change the product around because it's only going to be small details that will change. So for example, you might make a, a full film and not think anything at all about uh, sexuality at all, but there might be one particular scene or one particular character that you might want to change or perhaps add a character from a different sexuality in. Again, the main thing to avoid is causing offence. So you don't want to show someone from a certain sexuality in a negative light. You don't want to stereotype them with any sort of negative connotations. And the other thing is that, again, if you do have someone from another sexuality, it can really like attract a bigger audience. You can kind of get the, the gay scene involved into what you're watching, get people who are transsexual perhaps to come in and watch it again. And a, a really good example again is Orange is the New Black because they have people who are lesbian in it. They have um, a transsexual. So it kind of opens it up a little bit to a bit bigger audience. So you've studied psychographics in unit one which is basically showing how a lot of companies kind of create a psychographic about what their target audience is. They try to kind of create this picture of what the target audience will look like. Who is the person that's going to see this end product? What are they like? What are their interests? What do they do in their spare time? What do they like to do to relax? What are their family like? What is their health like? What do they look like? All these kind of things that they try to create. Now they do all of that by collating a load of information from like a questionnaire. So they'd give out questionnaires with a load of statements and people either agree or disagree with them. By doing that, it allows them to kind of categorize people into different um, groups. Then they can use that to kind of paint a picture for what the audience is going to look like. If you know that your target audience looks in a particular way, dresses in a particular way, is interested in these particular things, that will help you to create your product. Geodemographic is really important because it's based on the location of where the audience actually is. They might have different feelings or different kind of interests of people in other areas. So if you think about your product, it might not always be suitable for certain people. For example, you might have a large population of um, Asians living in a particular inner city. Now they might not they might definitely be offended by certain stereotypes that you might put in a TV show or in a film. Uh, however, again, if you want to target them as a group, you need to kind of put things in that might uh, appeal to them as well. Then you've got things like universal products that you might make. So if you make a TV show like The Inbetweeners, that was very, very popular in England. But if you show that same TV show in America, they won't be able to relate to it. They can't relate to the school life because it's completely different they might not understand what they're talking about they won't get all of the slang language that's used so you need to think about the language that you're going to use so finally a big big influence over your product is whether it's a mainstream or a niche audience if you are doing your product for a mainstream audience then you need to kind of bear in mind that your audience is really really big you've got people that have kind of following conventional tastes which is what most people seem to like but also you need to bear in mind that it's got to be attractive to a lot more people so you've got to think that your audience is a lot bigger you don't want to cause offense you don't want to put people off but you would need to appeal to kind of both genders bigger age range and that makes it a little bit more difficult however a niche audience is when it's very very specific so the market is very very small and it's very very specific you need to make sure that it's a bit more exclusive you've got things that are going to stand out to the people that you're targeting so from a magazine point of view um, if you think about something like the tv times that is mainstream because everybody in the country could read it nobody's going to be you know deterred away from reading it no one's going to be not interested most people a conventional taste is that they will watch tv might be different programs but they're all watching some sort of tv program so that makes it a mainstream product 
However, for a niche product, it could be something specific like golf or fishing, where the people that are reading it are interested in that particular thing. If they're not, then they're not going to read it. So the final thing to look at for learning outcome two is now that you know kind of what the client wants and how to analyze a client brief and you understand the audience considerations. So what kind of things do you need to bear in mind about your audience when you're doing it? You need to think about how you can actually plan what you're going to do. So you know what the client wants, you know who the audience is, and you've got a real picture about who's going to see this final product. What do you do next? So we need to look at the tools for planning. So we've got a mind map, mood board, blue sky thinking and SWOT analysis. So the first tool is a mind map. Now this can be as simple or as complex as you want, really. It's completely down to you. One thing it does allow is for you to kind of keep expanding to get bigger and bigger, go into more detail. So I've seen very, very basic mind maps and then mind maps that can continue to kind of move on and move on and develop the ideas. It's basically a document that's used during the initial phase of planning. So it's one of the very, very first things that you do. Um, you put in all your ideas together and they all kind of come off from one central area. So you could put maybe the title of your film or the topic or the genre of your film or whatever it is that you're making in the middle. And then you branch off with different things. So if it was for a movie and I was going to do it, you might put what the genre is. So action, thriller or sci-fi drama in the middle. And then from that, you could maybe have titles, possible titles, and then branch off from there. You could have uh, actors and then which actors could you include? You could have characters, uh, which type of characters you're going to have? What are they like? What's their ages? What's their gender? What's their appearance? You could have the storylines, you could have the plots, you could have locations, all sorts of different bits of information. And it allows you to um, keep developing, keep adding all your ideas together. When you do have a little bit more of an idea what you are going to do and you want to start coming up with a kind of visual representation of, of what the product's going to look like, you can do a mood board. Now, this is basically a collection of images, but often people include like words, like maybe the title of the film or words that kind of relate to the topic that you're doing. Uh, a lot of the time people put different fonts in, so fonts that you might use for the title or fonts that you might use in the magazine. And sometimes objects or pictures that relate to that particular topic. Uh, sometimes they show colour schemes as well. So if you're making a magazine, making um, some sort of print production or comic book, you might have some colours on there that kind of illustrate what kind of theme you're going for. So with the two examples on here, one's from the movie Seven. So this is the title. Then you have kind of the words that relate to it so the actual seven deadly sins and then there's a lot of iconography so there's like the cross to make it look kind of religious and where it's coming from with the bible then there's a lot of images that kind of are from the film as well and the one at the top looks like it's kind of for an actual idea for a new film with a potential title called ladybird and then a lot of images that kind of relate to the character and to show what the kind of audience might look like as well Now, blue sky thinking is an interesting one because the whole concept of it really is where you get together with a group of individuals that could be you and your team and you're basically just sitting there with a piece of paper or a whiteboard read the brief so you read the client brief what's expected from you and you just kind of write down any ideas that come into your head so it's literally just right i've been asked to do something for 16 to 24 year olds a website and about holidays and it's like okay what are we doing and people just come up with ideas and you write them all down and you kind of go from there. Now, the interesting part of this is you don't really put too much thought into the ideas. So you don't kind of like criticize, you don't get rid of any ideas. You don't worry too much about any constraints. You just kind of come up with them and then analyze each idea as you go. Finally, a SWOT analysis is used for kind of looking at your initial ideas. So if you'd used blue sky thinking and um, maybe done the mind map, 
you could go through and analyze the ideas that you've come up with and look for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, this is a really useful thing to do for everything, really, all the way through pre-production. You can do it for a location, even just one location that you might film in or one color scheme that you're going to pick and look at what the strengths and the weaknesses, opportunities and threats of, of using that color scheme. You can use it for pretty much anything and it's really useful tool to do. So you basically for strengths, pretty obvious, you're going through all of the good things about this particular idea. The weaknesses are looking at the bad things, any disadvantages, things that could go wrong. The opportunities are looking at things that you could do to improve, maybe things that you can gain from using this particular idea. And the threats are looking at any kind of obstacles that you might face, things that could go wrong, something that your competitors are doing, um, anything that could be negative towards the whole project from what you're doing with this idea. So that's pretty much everything you need to know for learning outcome two. Now you just basically need to practice looking at client briefs, picking out the key requirements, um, learning your definitions, thinking about what you can use the different tools for, and all your audience considerations.